time of worship and really just connect our hearts to God this morning and, and get focused for this week ahead. Um, so I just hope that everybody's doing well. Um, we've got one amazing thing coming up, and you may not connect to it directly, but I want you to know that it's going on. So this Sunday coming up, we have a beach bash baptism um, for children that accepted Christ during vacation Bible school, and we have 15 children being baptized on Sunday evening next week. Isn't that awesome? Uh, so amazing, and uh, we're excited to identify with those families and connect their children, and away we go. So we connect them into the life of the church and, and just start to pour into them and allow them to see God uh, through a new lens in their life. So with that exciting news, you guys ready for a great Sunday? All right, I invite you, if you will, to stand. And let's start this morning off by praying the Lord's Prayer together. Let's do that. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for this morning, God, and, and the opportunity just to, just to be present. Well, we know your scripture says that you are, you are omnipresent, so you were here before we arrived this morning. But there's something special when the people of God draw their hearts together, when we sing and we worship and we study scripture. There is a, a plurality that is discovered amongst one another. And so, God, I pray that, that we would just get the opportunity to experience your presence in a profound new way today. Lord, and, and even for those folks that are online, and there's no space, there's no distance for your Holy Spirit. And I just pray that you do a deep work inside of us today. Uh, take the teaching, take the message, and just um, raise us to new levels of our faith, new understandings. And um, God, I just pray you call us to something deeper. Um, I pray for all those folks that are, that are struggling today, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Uh, Lord, you know my good friend Todd, who's having surgery today at 11, emergency surgery. And God, we just pray that, that you'd be present to him and all the doctors. But, but just thinking about him, I know that all of us have family members that are sick and struggling. And, and Lord, be the great physician today. Um, we just entrust you with all of that. Lead us through this time. We love you. We trust you. And it is in your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come thou found of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet. Sung by flaming tongues above, praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I've come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger Wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. O oh, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. 
Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Lord, thank you for your goodness today, God, and thank you for your faithfulness to us. Thank you that it is always, always steady and, and just a source of strength and hope and joy for us. Um, God, I, I ask that you, you just continue to supply that as you always have, Lord. Please be with uh, Pastor Jim Bell as he comes to deliver your word, God, and I pray that you just ready us to, to receive that and to chew on it and to take it with us and digest it throughout the week. In your name we pray, amen. You guys can be seated. Good morning. In our present study that we have been into now for a few weeks, these beginning chapters of the book of Genesis, we, we now come to one of the most encouraging passages that we can find in the entire Bible. And it pertains to how God speaks to the devil right after the fall of mankind. You know, it's a word for those times when we feel that the cause of goodness and righteousness has basically just disappeared. It's absolutely hopeless. Sometimes we go through periods of time in our life where we feel that way. Because if you think back on your own experience, you must have had those times where you say, it just isn't worth it. it nothing works out. Nothing works out right. There are many Christians living today that, who are private reflecting on the philosophy that's found in a limerick. And that limerick goes like this, and maybe you can identify with this. It says this, Our race has a noble beginning, but man spoiled his chances by sinning. We hope that the story will end in God's glory, but at present the other side's winning. I think we all go through times like that where we think, we're on the losing end here. We're losing. We just don't see any victory whatsoever in in the future. You know, the passage we're going to look at today is a very clear denial of what I just read to you. That limerick. We've already seen that immediately following their fall, God took Adam and He took Eve, and He basically took them by the hand and lovingly but also firmly, he led them somewhere. Now, they were protesting their innocence, but he led them along an examination or a little bit of a history lesson of what had happened. And the result of that gentle but firm hand that he was using, he's taken those two back to a place where we can take a look at what we have done or who we are, or what we've become, or what our attitudes might be, and we can say ourselves, yes, Lord, it was wrong. I did it. Or is that Adam, or is that Adam and Eve said, yes, Lord, I ate. And they got rid of all that rationalization about finger-pointing and blaming and if only, or, you know, I can consider it this way, and so I'm going to disregard certain things. That rationalization goes in our lives over and over and over again. We can get rid of it. That's what he really wants us to do. Because when Adam and Eve, when they acknowledged, they were honest, and they acknowledged their guilt, we saw something. We saw that God immediately... He became their defender. His first words to the tempter came out. And the first words that he gave to the tempter 
were words of judgment. This is exactly in line with the promise given to us in the first letter of John, where John says, But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Because as long as we become our own lawyer, as long as we de- try to defend ourselves, his defense isn't going to work. It's not going to prevail. It's not going to, it's not going to be any availability to us whatsoever. But when we are ready to stop rationalizing, when we are stop, want to stop defending ourselves on what we've done, guess what? We have a perfectly adequate defender right in front of the Father. So now, in this third chapter of Genesis, the Lord God speaks to Satan. Chapter 3, verse 14. It says this, So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you eat dust all the days of your life. Now we have already seen in prior weeks that in this series that God is not really speaking to a serpent, but he's speaking to what is defined as a shining one. A shining one. And that's the literal translation, if you will, of what we read here in the Hebrew. Now later on in scriptures, the word that we see here is used for snake. It's used for serpent. But its primary meaning here is that of a shining one. And the reason we know that is because the Apostle Paul in his second letter to the church at Corinth, he says that the serpent appeared to Eve as an angel of light. Angel of light. Shining one. These words that God is addressing to the tempter are not a reference to the fact that snakes go around all their lives on their bellies. Well, that's true. They do that. But they do not literally eat dust the way it's described here. So what we have to understand is sometimes these, this, this language, this figurative language, is, we find used that way many, many other places in Scripture as well. The words here depict and describe something for us. They de- depict and describe humiliation and degradation. Think about it. To this day, all these centuries later, one of the most humiliating things that anyone can be forced to do is to lie on your belly in the dirt. It never changed. We feel that same way today as it happened back then. Because it signifies something. It signifies that that pride has been brought low. You know, the devil is humiliated. And he's shamed. The next time you are watching TV, next time, especially a Western, I think Westerns are the greatest parallel to the gospel message because it gets it right. So the next time you're watching a Western and you hear the hero say, all right, you snake, crawl out of there on your belly. You've heard it before. Or maybe... The hero comes around and he says, just give me a chance and I'll make him lick the dust. And we're cheering. We know what he means. We know what he's trying to do. You're probably, when you're hearing something like in a movie, you are probably just repeating a Sunday school lesson you had from when you were a kid. This incident here in Genesis chapter 3 is what makes Westerns really so popular because it gets it right. Because there is within that Western a gospel message that you learned sometime back when you were a kid in Sunday school. They have the same basic characters. And guess what? They have the same basic ending as well. Because in Westerns, what happens? There's a hero, there's a villain. 
And who wins in the end? It's the good guy. Now we know that to be true, but that's when someone's going to say, well, let me tell you what, that may work and be true in Westerns, but it ain't true in my life. It's not true in the lives of people I know. In life, it's not the good guys that win. It's the evil ones. You know, in life, you find ruthless power triumphing over good. You see it all the time. Good guys oftentimes end up as victims. So then people then point out, you know, what about the six million lives that were lost in the Holocaust, the Holocaust back in the 1940s, or the struggle going on with civilization, civilians right now being killed in the Ukraine. And there's countless other tragedies we see almost every day, injustices every day that we've talked about and we read about and we hear about. And it goes on and on and on and on. But the declaration of this passage is that it does occur. It is true. It is the devil's burden that he shall always end up as the defeated one. Let's take a look at the big picture. He's always going to be the humiliated one, falling on his belly and eating dust. Our problem is that we don't wait or we don't get to watch or see the end of the movie, the end of the story. We're in the story. Now, we do when we put TV on and we watch television because you and I both know that by the end of that program, Matt Dillon or the Lone Ranger or the four guys in Bonanza we're all going to get this done and work out to the good, and the guy, good guys are going to win, and they're going to do it in 60 minutes at the most. If you're talking Lone Ranger, you're, you're going to do it in 30 minutes. But in this life, this drama goes on and on and on and on and on. And we don't seem to get to the end of the story in our lives as well. You know, the next verse in chapter 3 tells us exactly how God proposes to accomplish the devil's humiliation. And he says this in verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. That is one of the most remarkable verses you're going to find anywhere in Scripture. The early church called this verse proto-evangelism. Proto-evangelism, which means it's the very first preaching of the gospel in the Bible. And we made it all the way to chapter 3. And we already see the gospel being introduced. It is the clearest promise. It is the first appearing in the Bible of the coming of a Redeemer. And there are a number of unusual features about this verse which gives us an idea about the hand of God and how He's going to act and how He's going to work. First of all, notice that it predicts an unending enmity to exist in two ways, two different ways. The first manifestation is that of the enmity between Eve and the serpent. Eve and the shining one. Now, that's not hard to understand. You think about it, you put yourself in the position of Eve. Eve would absolutely detest, she would absolutely hate the one who had betrayed her by giving her all those lies. He would, she would hate him as the effects of the fall would become more and more evident to her and her husband. She would feel a continuing abhorrence against the one who had cleverly and ruthlessly 
got her off track. It also was not enmity merely between the woman and the devil, which is understandable, but it's also between his seed, Satan's seed, and her seed. We also see that here. So here we have a remarkable, remarkable prophecy pointing to the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. And this, is, this concept of the seed of the woman is very, very unique in the Bible. Very unique. It's not found anywhere else, as a matter of fact. The seed of a woman. Because everywhere else you go in Scripture, the descent is really reckoned through the male line. It comes through men. It's the seed of the man that is the line of descent. So all the genealogy you see in the Bible and so forth is based upon man, not woman. Even today, you know, think about it. Even today, most families bear the man's name upon marriage. Woman gets married to a man, she takes his name. Vast majority of time, even today. But here we're told that the one who will crush the serpent's head is the seed not of a man, it's the seed of the woman. No mention at all here of man's seed that you see so often in other parts of the Bible. You know, you go back to the, the Gospel of Matthew, go back to the Gospel of Luke, and they both reference the virgin birth of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 1, we are told that an angel appeared to Joseph. Joseph uh, is, is Mary's pledged husband. And he appears to tell him that what is conceived in Mary is of the Holy Spirit. So the gospel is very, very clearly established that Jesus was born of a virgin, of a woman, but not of a man. The seed of a woman. Apostle Paul makes an oblique reference to this, if you will, in his letter to the Galatians, where he says of Jesus that he was born of a woman. But when you think about it, we all are. You take a look at it, generally all of us are included in that statement. So the implication by him making such a broad statement is that this was an unusual condition, that Jesus was born of a woman and only of a woman. All of this is confirmed in Genesis chapter 3 by the masculine pronoun, which follows the statement, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head. That masculine pronoun definitely indicates that the fulfillment of this promise, the seed of the woman, would be a man. Born of a woman. But it is not only Christ, for we now know that the seed that he talks about here was not only just Jesus and an individual. The seed is also a people against whom this enmity of Satan would continue throughout all the ages. The seed is not only Jesus and Jesus alone. The seed is you. The seed is me. Because we are in Christ. You know, Scripture describes this enmity as the flesh warring against the Spirit. And I'll tell you what, we have all felt that as we live our lives. Maybe even now you're sitting here and you're struggling with some things in your life. And we know, we know what God wants of us. Depending on where we are, we're learning to walk in the Spirit. And yet, well, we sure do like and desire to walk the way we want to walk, where we want to walk, to wherever we want to go. And we you know what we do? We do it. We do it. 
So there's this unending enmity between these two. And therefore, we are constantly exposed to an attack. We're constantly exposed to manipulation because of it. In the letter to the Galatians, we find that Paul talks about the children of the flesh that persecute what he calls the children of promise. Children of the flesh, children of promise. Now we know very, very well that the world out there hates the truth of God. You see it everywhere. The world out there seeks to ridicule God, seeks to stamp out Christianity. The world, many places, bans the Bible. The world, in many places, persecutes the saints. But then there's a remarkable thing happens, which is the great thrust, the great direction of this passage. The devil's burden is that the victories which he achieves are the very things that also become his defeats. He succeeds in bruising Christ's heel. He does. But that bruised heel is what finally crushes the serpent's head. You see that clearly in the cross. It was the bruising of the cross that made possible the smashing triumph of resurrection. There had to be a death first before a resurrection could follow. Take the matter of the dying of those six million Jews under Hitler. You know, I don't know whether you could describe or think about a more absolute tragedy. It's even hard to comprehend what the world was like and what took place. Yet it was that event, when you think about it, it was that event that set the stage It was that event that made possible just a couple of years later the birth of the nation of Israel. Do you think if Israel was not a nation today that it could become one based on the way the world sees it? Set the stage for the fulfillment of the promises which have lain unanswered in the Scriptures for century after century after century. The enemy's attempt to stamp out the people of God turned into a huge defeat. We don't have to go back. We can go back even further. We go back to the 16th century. Read about Martin Luther. He took a very courageous stand against the ridiculous rituals and empty ceremonies and rites and rules and regulations of the medieval church in Europe. People were getting disgusted by what the church had become. Indulgences and paying outright bribes to get your loved one into heaven. You know, when Martin Luther nailed the 95 Thesis to the door of that church in Wittenberg, Germany. He struck a spark that caught fire, not just in Germany, throughout Europe itself. It was the devil's efforts to weaken the church to irrelevancy that really made possible the Reformation in the first place. He thinks he's won. Oh, wait. Oh, no, you didn't. A few weeks ago, right here at Community Life Church, Scott preached a four-week series he called Joyride. You might remember that. It was an examination of the very short four chapters that we find in Paul's letter to the Philippians. And if you think back to those messages, the Emperor Nero has placed the Apostle Paul in prison 
And he has been chained all day, all night, to a member of the elite Praetorian Guard on a rotational basis. So, from Paul's standpoint, things are looking a little bleak. And yet, God skillfully turns that situation to his own glory. Paul understood perfectly. He understood exactly that when he said this in the first chapter and 12th verse of that letter, and he said this, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. He confirmed that with what he says in chapter 4, ups the ante. All God's people here, prison, all God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. That's interesting. Do you think that Paul would have had a field day teaching these guards the gospel of Jesus Christ? He probably was just utterly so excited to do that. You can just picture him doing that. Talk about a captive audience. That's a good pun. He says, as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. In fact, because of the atrocities and horrors unleashed by the Emperor Nero himself, that Nero himself was almost single-handedly responsible for the spreading of the gospel. It left Jerusalem in a hurry. And it went to all the adjoining nations of the world. Spread quicker than wildfire. Did that because of his attempts to wipe out Christianity. He persecuted those who believed in Jesus Christ. And in doing so, the church goes everywhere. You might call that bruising heels and crushing heads in action. And that's exactly what took place. So 20 centuries later, here we are, we live in a world which demonstrates the truth of those passages. And 20 centuries later, we see how God continues to turn the tables on the devil. And just like he did many, 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 many years ago, Satan is overreaching himself today, as he always does. It is his fate to end up as those villains, how they used to end up in the old Western melodramas we talked about a little bit earlier. And you know the story, you know them well. The villain has taken all the loot. And before he takes the loot and he leaves, he's trapped his victims in the old silver mine. And he set the dynamite charges. And they didn't use fuses back. Remember, they take the, the, the gunpowder. They put the gunpowder and make a trail to the dynamite. He'd set it off. And he lights the fuse. And he covers his crime. And he's on the verge of success. But to his horror, the hero arrives. The hero arrives on the scene. And he's riding what? He's riding a horse. What color is the horse? Well, obviously it's a white horse. They're always white. And the hero saves the day. The villain who saw it all going his way all of a sudden sees it crashing down. And usually the villain's name is something like Black Bart. 
He's all got, he's got some dark name. But Black Bart finds it's all falling apart, and he stumps, stomps off, and he knows he's been defeated again, and he's muttering, and he's got the mustache, and he's going, curses foiled again. You know, that has been and always will be Satan's burden. He loses. We know that. You can see this principle in your own personal lives as well. Because which of you has not had some experience, not exactly like, but some experience similar to that of the Apostle Paul, who had that nagging, wretched, what he called a thorn in the flesh. A thorn that was given to him, that prodded him, that poked him, that just was always on his mind. He hated it. So he asked God to take it away. Please, God, take it away. And God said, no. No. So for all you people that think that God always answers no to prayer, no, no. God says, no, I won't, because my grace is sufficient. My grace is all you need. That thorn in the flesh is nothing compared to what I can give you. And as Paul pondered that, and he had to ponder it because he's asked at least three times to have it removed, there came finally a realization of what God meant when he said that. And he writes it down for us. Because Paul says, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me and to keep me from becoming conceited. Conceited. God permitted this malady in Paul's life to keep him from becoming puffed up, proud. Because I'll tell you, once you get to that place, your usefulness to God sinks. That's why he can say, I will glory in my infirmities, for out of my weaknesses I'm made strong. The devil's burden. The God that we serve is the kind who is continually taking the worst that the devil can do and turning it into glorious victory. It's almost he's just juggling the things to keep it going. You'll find that principle running throughout the Bible, no matter where you're at, especially here in Genesis, especially in the book of Revelation. This is Christianity. Entirely different from the principles by which the outside world seeks to work out all its problems. We do it entirely different. Perhaps it's best expressed to us in the words of a poem. This is a poem that was written by a man by the name of James Russell Lowell. He says this. It starts, it starts out this way. Though the cause of evil prosper, yet tis truth alone is strong. Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Let me stop there. That's, that's the way it seems, doesn't it? It's the way it feels sometimes. That wrong is forever on the throne and truth is off to the side. It looks as though truth is pinned down. The, the truth is really crucified. The truth is wrongfully on the sidelines and all the bad things are on the throne. Seems like evil seems to rule and reign. But this poet is right because he concludes his poem. He says, Yet that scaffold sways the future and behind the dim unknown standeth God amid the shadows, keeping watch above his own. That's the devil's burden. He has to sit and watch God continually redeem situations and people that Satan feels are under his control. His head is crushed. 
his time is very limited. He can never triumph. Aren't you glad you're not on his side? Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, the world out there does not see you for who you are. And Lord, every place we go in Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, we are seen over and over and reminded over and over again of your grace and your mercy, of your ways. Lord, there's always, it's always maybe too often that we don't wait to the end of the story. We know what the end of the story tells. We know what's going to end. We don't have to be there to know that. You've already given us the truth. So Lord, give us the strength as we live our lives today and, and, and we know that everything that we see, good and bad, is under your control. Lord, we thank you for the blessings that you've given us. We thank you for the gift of your Son. And Lord, he's not wearing a white hat. He, he's wearing a crown of glory. And Lord, that crown is also ours. So Lord, allow us to live this day and every day not focused on the temporal, but focused on the eternal, which is truth, which is eternal, which never ends. And Lord, we are on that side. In Christ's name we pray it. Amen. Have a great day today.